the introduction. Um, so I, I wanted to just talk a little bit about myself uh, to start things off. Um, I was going to have a picture of myself, but I figured I don't know who'd want to look at that. I mean, you can uh, have a look at the, my dog instead. Um, so I started off uh, by doing a, a bachelor degree in software engineering. Uh, I then completed my MD. Um, and then I went on to do a general surgery residency, which I recently finished in July. Uh, and that leads me to now. I am a computer science master's student here at the U of A. Um, so my interests are obviously general surgery and artificial intelligence uh, is the focus of my, of my master's, uh, master's degree. Um, and I'm really excited about everything that's been happening in the field, um, all the advances. Things have been moving very, very quickly. Um, and it, it doesn't seem like there's a, an obvious end or, or top tip of, of a bubble in sight. It really looks like this is uh, sustained growth and things are going to continue to get better and better in this field. So very exciting. Uh, to, to just go over my disclosures, no financial disclosures yet. Um, cross my fingers for the future, maybe. Um, my, uh, this presentation uh, and my knowledge is generally Alberta focused and academic focused because uh, I have done all of my medical training in Alberta and I have lived essentially my entire adult life in academia. So from the perspective of, perspective of industry or commercial uh, aspects of, uh, of AI in healthcare, uh, I know less about it, a little bit, but not as much. Um, and then also I do tend to talk fast and I might skip over or breeze over concepts uh, that may not be familiar to everyone because I know we have a really diverse audience, which is awesome. Um, so feel free to stop me at any point. Um, let's see, I'm going to try to, to monitor the, um, the chat. Oh, thank you. Uh, as best I can. Um, but again, pop questions away in the chat. Um, if you want to speak up and unmute yourself, feel free to do that as well. I'm very happy to answer questions. Uh, so a little outline, uh, I will talk about the domains of medicine that will form the basis of, of this talk and that kind of differentiate it um, from the domains of medicine data types. One lecture that preceded me from Amira and then the uh, domains of medicine uh, in data types three lecture uh, that will be after this in a couple of weeks. Um, I'll then talk about the sources of data um, that are most affiliated with these domains of medicine. And I'll talk a little bit about the specifics of these things. Um, I do want to take this opportunity to also say that um, because I'm, I'm focusing this talk on a, on a more general audience, there's not as much sort of technical data, but I'm super happy to get into the weeds if anybody wants to ask me about uh, technical applications of things, um, exactly what certain data looks like and what you can do with it. I'm very happy to answer those things as well. Uh, after that, I'll have a couple quick sections on how to access data yourself uh, and then how to get involved. A little bit of a guide um, to, to starting to work in the, uh, in the AI and healthcare field. As a quick aside, I did want to talk about medical training. Um, just so that you have an idea of, of kind of who who is doing what at what times, um, because it can, it can help you when you're looking for uh, collaborators. It can help to know what stage they're at um, from the level of expertise, and then also um, from how much time they're going to have, how much, um, how much desire to do research uh, that they're going to have. And, and then potentially, if you're interested in commercial applications, um, it might help to know exactly where people are at uh, in their careers. So medical training starts uh, with medical school, uh, which lasts three to four years. Um, you then have to complete a mandatory residency, which is typically between two and six years. Um, the standard line for how long it takes is two years for family medicine and five years for specialties with a few small exceptions. After that, you are at that point an attending physician. If you're a specialist, you can be called like a specialist or a consultant, or if you're a family doctor, you're a family doctor at that point. And at that point, you can choose to do further training in a subspecialty, uh, and that's called a fellowship. So you can typically people do that for one to two years. Some people do more than one fellowship. Some people do graduate training either before medical school 
uh, during medical school or residency or afterwards, um, such as myself, I've chosen to do uh, a master's after my residency. And uh, for example, I am planning on, on pursuing uh, fellowship uh, subspecialty training after this as well. So getting into the specific domains of, of medicine uh, that kind of form the basis of this talk. So I will start with internal medicine, which is an absolutely enormous, enormous field. Um, I will certainly not do it justice by talking about it here very quickly, but I will do my best. Um, so this refers to the medical as opposed to surgical treatment of internal diseases. So pretty much anything inside of the body um, is a, a branch of internal medicine. Internal medicine um, doctors are specialists. They almost exclusively do a minimum of five years of training. Um, and it can range from rheumatology, uh, which is the study of joints um, and connective tissue and is almost entirely an outpatient based specialty, um, all the way to intensive care unit physicians or critical care physicians um, who exclusively practice um, or essentially exclusively practice within hospitals uh, in a very, very high acuity setting. Um, I did mention, so a lot of these specialties are also a combination of the inpatient and outpatient care. Um, as an explanation, just in case anyone's not familiar, inpatient care is care that happens within a hospital, within a hospital to admitted patients. Uh, and generally, but not always, will include emergency care. Outpatient care is care uh, that is delivered typically in a clinic. Um, but sometimes, for example, you could have uh, like an outpatient surgery where you go into a hospital, you have your surgery and you leave the same day, you're never admitted, still considered outpatient care. Internal medicine concerns itself with complex specialized care. So even the generalists within internal medicine, GIM or general internal medicine, uh, they're still considered specialists and they will take care of very, very sick patients in the hospital. Um, typically patients that have multiple issues uh, that are going on all at once. Even though this is a medical specialty as opposed to surgical, there are procedures within the specialty and certain subspecialties of internal medicine have lots and lots of uh, procedures. So for example, gastroenterology, the study of the gut, um, they do endoscopy, flexible tubes with cameras on them that go either through the mouth or through the anus uh, to inspect the gut. Uh, pulmonology or respirology, depending on if you're describing it uh, as a, in the American term or the British term, I can never remember which one is which. Um, they'll perform frequent bronchoscopy, which is again, typically a flexible tube with a camera on it going into the windpipe to look at the, uh, the windpipe and the lungs. Cardiology, not all of cardiology um, is procedure focused or procedure heavy, but inter interventional cardiologists in particular are the ones who will often put stents in people's hearts if you're having a heart attack, for example. Uh, oh, cool. We have uh, a question. Out of curiosity, what programming language do you program in? Which is best for AI? I'm an oral surgeon and do bioinformatics. I work exclusively in R. R is an excellent uh, language, and there are lots of um, machine learning um, plugins um, uh, and, and kind of frameworks that can be attached to R, um, which is great. I use mostly Python. And the biggest reason that I use Python is because it's the most popular programming language in, uh, in artificial intelligence today. Um, in reality, you can use lots of different languages. Um, the, probably the best supported one right now, my recommendation uh, if you're starting uh, in it would be Python. I would look into what, uh, um, what R has for, for plugins um, with things like, uh, like I think Keras has, um, has a R packages or, um, and uh, potentially PyTorch or a, a Torch one. Okay, um, moving on, pharmacy, not exactly a medical uh, specialty in terms of the MD, uh, but certainly an incredibly important part of medical care. Um, so pharmacy refers to the administration of drugs, both in the inpatient and the outpatient setting. 
And there is just tons and tons and tons of data here. Um, it is voluminous, it's interdependent data. So it's not just prescription data that is given to particular patients. Um, there's tons of data within, within the field of pharmacy uh, that pertain to side effects and drug interactions. There's different families of, of drugs, uh, of medications that are similar to each other, but not always the same. Um, and so it can make for a lot of complex data and, and analyzing the data um, can require a lot of serious statistical power. Um, and there are a lot of low hanging fruit to be found within the whole sort of drug setting uh, in terms of big data and, uh, and artificial intelligence. Uh, another important dimension of pharmacy uh, that is often uh, not ignored, but is less prominent is the cost of drugs, um, which often factors into um, to patients um, taking their medications, being able to afford them, um, and then efficacy, of course. So efficacy um, not only changes uh, between different populations, um, but there is, uh, there is significant variability in the efficacy of specific drugs from patient to patient. And this kind of underlies uh, the, the, the precision medicine um, uh, paradigm that has been gaining momentum uh, over the past decade or so, um, that certain drugs are going to be better for certain people than other ones. And a lot of this work is tying into uh, genetics um, which I, I'm not going to get into as much because it is the topic of future presentations, but tons and tons of data uh, available here and lots of low hanging fruit. Moving on to surgery, the best specialty, uh, no bias at all here. Um, many, many subspecialties within surgery. Um, there's the best of the best at general surgery, again, no bias. Um, this concerns itself mostly with, uh, with operations involving the abdomen, but a little bit of other stuff as well, such as breast surgery uh, and some neck surgery. Um, orthopedic surgery, uh, which is surgery involving the bones and the joints. Plastic surgery, which is skin, um, bones of the hand and face in, uh, in Canada mostly, um, as well as uh, reconstructive surgery. ENT, ear, nose, throat, kind of self-explanatory. Neurosurgery, uh, which is surgery involving the brain or spinal cord. Ophthalmology, surgery involving the eye and related structures. And there are certainly many more specialties or subspecialties of surgery. I don't want to discount uh, oral surgery, for example. Um, there's also urology, vascular surgery, thoracic surgery. The list kind of goes on. So it, it's a, it's a, an enormous field, um, certainly on par with the size of internal medicine. Um, it is a combination of emergency, inpatient, and outpatient care. Um, part of the reason that I, I do describe that it, it is inpatient and outpatient care um, is that this does reflect the practice of, of many, many surgeons. Um, there's, there's probably more care delivered in clinics than people think that's involved with surgical care. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, the focus generally is on information collected in an inpatient setting. However, as a, something that differentiates this from internal medicine, obviously there's also actual surgery. Um, and this is important from an AI and healthcare perspective uh, because AI can be applied to actual surgery, both in terms of uh, robotics, um, device, so either device manufacture or device usage, like devices that use AI, um, and then also potentially for, um, for invasive or partially invasive testing. For example, uh, intraoperative ultrasound is frequently used in certain types of liver surgery um, and that could be something that could be a, an excellent focus for, um, for an artificial intelligence application. All right, down into, uh, into uh, the dark rooms looking at, uh, looking at images. So starting from that, we have pathology. I love pathologists. Um, 
<laughs> I poke fun a little bit, um, but their specialty is super interesting, very, very different from the rest of medicine uh, and absolutely crucial um, to, uh, to patient care. So pathology is the field of looking at things that have been taken out of patients in general. So that would typically be things like tumors that are resected in a surgery, biopsies that are taken uh, either by uh, a specialist uh, or by a family doctor, for example, um, and then all the way down to very, very, very small things that are taken out, such as fine needle aspiration, where a syringe with a needle on it, excuse me, is introduced into, uh, let's say, like a thyroid lump, aspirated, and some of the cells get into the syringe, and then those cells are looked at under the microscope to help determine if, if that lump has cancer in it or not. Um, pathology does go all the way up from super tiny cells to entire people. Um, it, it does also concern itself with autopsies, um, with making definitive, hopefully definitive diagnosis uh, based on whole uh, cadavers. Generally speaking, the data in pathology is images, almost all of it. So this typically takes the form of slides, um, such as the one that, that you see here on, on the left. Um, so they are prepared in a special manner. They're sectioned into very thin slices and stained, and then looked at under the microscope at, at, high, uh, at high magnification. There has been a transition over the past 20 years or so um, from looking at uh, pathology slides directly under the microscope to slowly um, digitizing this process um, and then making the diagnosis on screens, for example. So this, uh, these are called whole slide images um, or WSIs. They're very, very large. They're like gigapixel images. Um, but people are starting to do uh, AI work with them. Um, and then notably as well, there are some open source tools that exist to view and manipulate WSIs. Uh, this image here I created using a program called ASAP, um, which is an open source slide viewer. Um, and it also facilitates annotation. So the green areas here, this isn't true color. Um, these have been labeled by an expert pathologist as areas of cancer in a breast cancer histology specimen. We got a question. Uh, right, okay. So formats of these files, so like I mentioned, the, the WSI is its own format and there is some standardization there. Um, I don't actually know if WSI has, or U of A has WSI scanners. I, uh, I don't know any of the pathologists at U of A here. And uh, I, I can tell you that where I trained in residency in Calgary, um, most of the diagnosis was still being made with uh, direct microscopy but I don't know that they may have had the WSI scanners and just didn't use it for everything. I'm not totally sure. Sorry, I can't answer that. Regarding the format of these files, like I mentioned, so WSI is a standardized format. And so it does allow you to, um, uh, to view these images um, uh, using the open source software. You can kind of do whatever you want with them. And that's great. Um, yeah, they are, it's a, it's a bitmap type format, um, so there's no compression in, uh, in, the, in the images, which also contributes to their extremely, extremely large size. Um, and the extremely, extremely large size of pathology images does make it hard to do uh, WSI image classification using off-the-shelf tools. There's a lot of like little hacky ways that people have, uh, have put together um, to make uh, to make automatic uh, image classifiers to, to get diagnoses from slides uh, without a pathologist. Yes, so uh, there's a question about if we have to pre-process these WSIs uh, for models. So yes, I think every single, every single machine learning imaging um, uh, paper that I've looked at has some pre-processing of, of images, um, just sort of due to the nature of, uh, of health, um, health imaging data. Um, in particular, the, so the typical format that people will pre-process WSIs is they will break down the images into patches, um, and then they will do, uh, they will train a convolutional neural network on those patches. Ideally, this if you're doing this, then you have um, 
you have an, an image such as the one here that has like per pixel or nearly per pixel annotation so that your patches are labeled appropriately and you don't just say the whole thing is cancer. Although some approaches have tried to do things like that. Um, and then another issue in, in doing this that people are people do a lot of pre-processing to try to help out with this is that it helps if you can look at the overall architecture. Like if you just do that sort of patch-based analysis, um, then you end up with things that look like heat maps at the end that determine the probability that each that each patch in in uh, in the in the actual test set is is cancer or not. And so um, you have, you got to do a, a bunch of little clever things to try to um, to try to keep context and architecture um, from sort of a zoomed out view. Sorry, I don't know. I hope. Oh, okay, great. I hope that answered your question. Um, so, as an example of, uh, I thought this was this was a, a pretty good system um, uh, that does breast cancer histopathological image classification using a hybrid deep neural network. Um, so, this data set, which is publicly available, which is awesome, um, it looked at three thousand seven hundred seventy-one breast histology slides. Um, Oh, awesome. Thank you. Yes, that's the one. That's ASAP. That's the one that I use. Um, there's a, a link to ASAP in the chat. Um, this is great. I, I didn't know about uh, about Fiji. Uh, thanks for uh, for sharing that with us, uh, Shane. Another open source tool for viewing whole slide images. Um, so notably, uh, this paper did not use WSIs. They used what they called high resolution images, which I suppose they are high resolution um, in sort of the image world, um, but they were like 2,500 by, uh, by 1,500 uh, pixels, which is great, but it's not, not on the level of WSIs. Regardless, um, they used a deep convolutional neural network to capture small patch features, and then they used a recurrent neural network to capture short and long-term dependencies between patches, meaning um, they were able to get at some of the architecture of the uh, of the slides of the images. And they found that they could get up to 91.3% accuracy. This accuracy is compared to the gold standard here, which is of the pathologist looking at each of those images and making a diagnosis, so expert pathologists. It's always important when you're evaluating um, machine learning uh, in healthcare um, papers um, and any studies or, or any model really, you have to ask yourself, what is the ground truth? And does the data look like what it would need to be in real life? So if ground truth is what an expert pathologist is making the diagnosis on, then you're never going to be able to exceed the pathologist's performance. Let's it's hard for pathology to see how you could exceed a pathologist's performance. Like they tend to be the end of the line in diagnosis many times. Um, but for example, if you had if you had like a really incredible database and you followed every pathology patient that they made a diagnosis on for like ten years after they had a, a slide made, and you were able to determine more definitively than the pathology slides whether they actually had cancer, for example then you might be able to use that data to train a machine learning model that could exceed the, the accuracy of a pathologist. It would be difficult, but it's at least important to always ask yourself, where are they getting the ground truth? And how, how granular is it? How good is the data? Did they have one expert pathologist? They have multiple ones. What did they do in the case of disagreement? This, this segues well into radiology, the other kind of dark room specialty, which again, love radiologists. Um, it's the best going to chat with your neighborhood radiologist when you have a difficult case. Um, radiology, which is the field of looking inside of patients, not directly, so not with surgery uh, and not by putting something inside of them. Um, so typically the most common modalities that are used, x-ray, CT scan, which uses x-rays, like in the physics sense, to generate a three-dimensional um, image that is sliced up into, into many different, uh, different slices um, for clinical diagnosis. So here, um, this is an example of a CT scan uh, where the human being is sliced uh, along different axes and displayed, and you can scroll through each of these uh, to view the image. 
MRI, which generates a similar uh, type of uh, cross-sectional image, um, but uses a big magnet to affect the water molecules. And I'm not a physicist, so please don't ask any further questions about that. Uh, ultrasound uses a handheld probe that delivers sound waves uh, that are ultrasonic, you can't actually hear them, and then uses the echoes from those sound waves to generate images. As you can imagine, because someone has to hold the probe, it's not as reproducible as the other modalities. And then it's also highly operator dependent for how good the images are going to be. This has um, implications for machine learning applications because it's hard to guarantee exactly where the patient is positioned and where the probe is positioned in order to, um, to be able to definitively locate something in 3D space. People have done work with, um, with having like trackers on ultrasound probes um, so they can track their orientation and position in 3D space in order to generate uh, 3D models of the things that the ultrasound is looking at. Um, these aren't used clinically very much right now, but there's lots and lots of research um, opportunities there. Uh, the last moderately common one is something called scintigraphy, which is typically when a radio tracer is injected or otherwise delivered to the patient and then accumulates in the organ of interest. And then essentially they put just like a big x-ray film in front of the patient and the, uh, the radio tracer will deliver its own, uh, its own um, radiation, uh, which will hit the, uh, the film or detector and generate an image based on that. So this is as opposed to an x-ray where the x-rays are actually shot behind the patient and then you see kind of what is a shadow. Uh, let's see, there's a question. When these images are taken, is there any metadata stored that could be used for training? Like where was the image taken or this isn't guaranteed? Uh, like you said, you have to use external trackers. So interesting that you should ask that. Um, so these images, so typically most, most radiographic in images in a hospital are stored in uh, the DICOM format and DICOM format typically has places in it for metadata such as, uh, such as patient labels, um, identifiers. And the reason that they were initially put in like that is so that they can't accidentally uh, be mismatched um, so that it's all, it's all always um, delivered as a single file. And so that ideally um, mismatching, like, you know, like the digital equivalent of putting a sticker on the wrong, on the wrong x-ray doesn't ever happen. The problem, like the, this is a double-edged sword from a, from a AI perspective and a data perspective, because if you access DICOM images, um, unless you somehow manage to get uh, like Alberta Health Services, for example, to scrub the images of uh, identifiers, they typically come to you with patient identifiers. And so that means that you need to have ethics for that and a data sharing agreement in order to be able to be a custodian of uh, that patient information, even if the first thing you do is just get rid of it. Um, but the upside is, is that then you can link it to other information, um, which could potentially improve your model. I have only ever, so there's, the question is if, that you can't get the data without that information scrubbed before. I have only ever received data um, that has all of the identifying information in place, and then I have had to scrub it afterwards. And so it hasn't been a huge issue because in, for me, because the times that I have gotten data, um, other, other parts of the data that I have requested required um, have patient identifiers in them anyways. So it wasn't like there was a, there were any further um, sort of privacy um, difficulties with that. Okay. Um, radiographic images within the hospital are typically accessed or sometimes at home are typically accessed uh, with what's called a picture archiving and communication system or PACS. And so you, you use that, you'll hear that term uh, used 
all the time. This is what radiologists will use um, to actually make their diagnoses and often what other providers will use um, to access these images from in a clinical setting. Uh, I don't know what 40X is. Do you mean like the magnification or is that like a, like a 4K, 8K type thing? I don't actually know. Mm, I said multiple things there. Magnification. Um, so the magnification is typically to 200 times. And that's why they're so incredibly large, the images, because uh, at 200 times magnification, the image still looks really sharp. Like the resolution is very high. And so that's why they're, they're gigapixel. Um, the images are usually between, the ones I've worked with have been between four and eight gigabytes each. So really, really big. Yeah, awesome. Um, right, open source tools do exist to, to view and manipulate DICOM images as well. Oh, um, this picture on the right here, it was created using a, a program called Slicer. Um, Slicer is super awesome. It's open source. Uh, it is at least as good as, at the, as the, uh, the clinical uh, PAX software that's used uh, in Calgary and Edmonton. Um, there's like big warnings that are like, this is not intended to be used in a clinical setting. It's for research only. I'm like, ah, it, it, it works really, really well though. Um, so there's tons, of, there's tons of really good tools and it's all open source and has lots of, uh, uh, Thank you. It has lots of uh, embedded uh, functionality um, to connect it to uh, machine learning and other data tools. As an example of, um, of what can be done with radiological images for machine learning, um, I thought this was pretty interesting. This is a machine learning based hybrid feature analysis for liver cancer classification using fused MR and CT images. So what they did was they took single slices, so not full MRIs or CT scans, just single axial slices like this of, for the same patient. So this is the, the, image that, the images that they had in the paper are not representative because uh, these are from different patients of, for example, a benign mass like a hemangioma. And because they had images from both modalities and they were able to put them together, they were able to achieve uh, a higher accuracy in their final classifier uh, than when they use CT alone. So critically again here, I talked about um, paying attention to what the ground truth here is. The ground truth was uh, decided by expert radiologists, um, but on the plus side, they managed to get 99% accuracy. So again, if you could follow all of these people for 10 years, or if you could have autopsies done on 100% of them after they all die, and then you used all of that image, or sorry, all of that data and put fed it into your model, you could potentially exceed the accuracy of the radiologists. Um, but for this type of, type of thing, this is basically as good as it gets, like a 99% accuracy. And don't get me wrong, this could be incredibly, incredibly valuable from a, from a clinical standpoint in order to help radiologists do their job. Uh, but you do always have to think about what ground truth is and what the data is. Um, because these aren't, the, the image input is not um, whole MRs and CT scans. It's not something that you could just deploy out right away. These were hand-selected images of representative sl axial slices of, uh, of uh, liver abnormalities that were known. So you, you could deploy this on, on completely normal um, livers and trust it very well, for example. Uh, moving on to types of information, kind of flow of information. Um, so I know that Amira talked about um, family medicine and there's a lot of overlap in the outpatient information um, within the specialties of internal medicine, surgery, pharmacy, for example. So I'm not going to go over this very much. I'm really gonna focus things on the inpatient side. Um, I also just wanted to sort of see how much time I, I'm doing. Um, so I will, I will move on to the inpatient information. So just to get a, a flavor for what things would look like, um, what kind of data is generated during a patient visit. For example, if a patient arrives, let's say they arrive in the emergency department, 
the first thing that happens unless they're like super super sick is that they arrive and are registered um they they get then give or are uh, or are attached to pre-existing demographic information and some new visit information is generated these are generally excellent machine readable uh, fields that exist within a proprietary system typically as the visit begins, they begin to accumulate unstructured qualitative type data. So the first, the first one that they typically acquire will be a triage note, which uh, does have some machine readable things like vital signs, but also has like a one sentence summary uh, of what the patient is here for. They'll then get more detailed documentation, typically in sort of that unstructured free text format that would be uh, consult notes, admission notes, um, progress notes, uh, written all written by MDs. And they would also have lots and lots of nursing notes um, that are, are typically handwritten, but not always. Uh, and by handwritten, I mean like typed or, 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 or handwritten um, and are sometimes from things like drop down boxes. Through all of this, through the visit, there's also continuous collection of other parameters. So things like vital sign monitoring can range from taking someone's vital signs and getting several numbers once per day, all the way to a totally continuous data monitoring, which would typically be for very sick patients uh, in places like the emergency department, operating room, or intensive care unit. Um, intake and output is another important uh, data stream um, that I actually haven't seen very much work with at all. Um, so typically nursing or other providers will record um, intake not quite so accurately or not quite so often, but output, so things like urine output, drain outputs, um, sometimes unusual things like vomiting are recorded, um, and this is done on an intermittent basis. Um, and is often very accurate and very important to diagnosis from a clinical standpoint. And so um, there's, a, there's a lot of potential AI applications that could use things like that. Um, blood work, also another intermittent source of, of quantitative information that is typically or often collected throughout a patient's visit. Um, the amount often correlates with how sick someone is as well. Um, Machine learning uh, applications that I have seen in the literature typically look at vital signs um, and then other things like sometimes people will look at uh, electrophysiology. Uh, and again, I know Amir talked a, a whole lot about, uh, about that, so I won't, I won't dwell on that. Um, but there's, there's not a lot of work that's really put together um, all of the myriad data that is collected continuously um, throughout patients' visits. Finally, as they leave hospital, uh, they end up getting another qualitative uh, piece of data, um, a discharge summary, which is usually in free, uh, free text. Um, and then there is some further visit information, demographic type things um, that gets created, like date of discharge, for example, um, that uh, is very useful um, uh, from, a, from a data perspective, uh, from a research perspective. So as a bit of an example of vital signs um, across much of Alberta, probably still most of Alberta, um, vital signs are collected on paper. This is slowly going to change as uh, the provincial um, in-hospital uh, electronic medical record uh, called Connect Care or EPIC is gradually rolled out to more sites. Um, but this is very, very common to still see uh, this stuff recorded on paper. This question, uh, are these scanned? No, extremely rare. If you, if you need to look at someone's chart for a clinical purpose, you request their chart and they will physically go get the copies of this, of, uh, of uh, the vital signs and all of these things, and you will have a bunch of papers in front of you. If you do a research project that where you want to look at people's vital signs, either you pick a hospital where they have an electronic medical record where they, they keep track of the vital signs electronically, or you look at the paper stuff and you manually enter it by hand.
paper. And then you're like, oh, well, let's pick one of those ones where they have uh, an EMR. And you're like, oh, it's proprietary software and they're not gonna give you direct access to the system. Um, I do talk a little bit about how to access data um, at the end of my presentation here. So I'll get into it a little bit more then. Um, but the long and the short of it is that there is often a lot of manual data entry, even if you have computer access. It's much easier with computer access, but there's still likely to be manual data entry. And that does limit you if you're looking for like really, really enormous data sets. Um, if you did have access to such enormous data sets, there's pretty cool things you can do, however. Uh, this is an example of a sepsis prediction algorithm uh, that used 110,000 patient encounters um, that had the appropriate sort of number and duration of vital signs that they used. Uh, they created a decision tree learning model, and they were able to predict sepsis at 48 hours prior to onset better than current standard rule-based sepsis scoring systems like uh, SOFA or, or SIRS. How long until they move inpatient information into technology? Um, oh, you mean how long until, they, until every, nothing is on paper anymore? Um, the province is, uh, is planning on having everything in Epic or Connect Care uh, in something like seven, five to seven years. Um, it'll be sooner than that for Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, some of Edmonton already has it. Calgary has had an EMR that is kind of inconsistently used. Like it's something like 50% of Calgary's data is on paper. 50% of it is in an EMR. Um, all of Calgary has had that for, for several years though. Um, so it'll be something like five years before most of the province is on it. Uh, is there AI software to read videos such as colonoscopy video, which can be 30 to 60 minutes long? Yes, I don't have the, I don't have the, uh, the papers up right now, um, but there, there have been applications looking at the video in order to, um, um, to do polyp detection, um, because uh, that is something that during colonoscopy that um, has a potential high costs if it's missed, and it would be a great thing to outsource to a computer to help the, uh, the endoscopist too. Uh, are there places, cities slash countries that have everything or most in digital format? Yeah, absolutely. Like most places in the States do have this already. Um, <laughs> um, IT in healthcare is often at least 10 years behind in Canada um, compared to the United States. Um, and that's, I would predict that that's virtually entirely uh, a, a function of, uh, of cost. Um, yeah, so if you're somehow able to get American data, they do have lots and lots of data. Um, fragmenta data fragmentation is a problem in the States um, because there's so many different healthcare providers um, and companies um, and everybody kind of wants to silo their own information. It can be difficult for them to assemble very large databases um, that are actually representative. Um, so there's, there's, uh, there's upsides and downsides. Like the upside to getting information in Alberta is that if you, are, if you are successful in finding a good repository, it can often be representative of the entire province, which then becomes very, very high quality data and often with very, very large N. Uh, okay, you might be thinking, well, what about neck care? Like we do have this excellent system in Alberta. Um, what about that? So neck care is, uh, is like a provincial EMR system. Um, all it is is for retrieving information. So it's not, it's not about, um, about putting in orders for patient or providing clinical care, um, but it is a repository and it contains, for example, blood work, imaging, most special tests, and many, many, many uh, clinical notes for things like uh, consult notes, discharge summaries, for example, um, for virtually every patient in the province since 2007. Um, it is an excellent source of clinical information, totally indispensable. Um, and as far as I know, there's no provinces or at least no large provinces um, that have a completely unified system like this, except for Alberta. 
the biggest issue with it is that it's virtually impossible to get access to it for research or commercial purposes. Uh, the exception, sort of the hoops that you would have to jump through or the ways that you could get it is if you have a written consent from each patient, um, which virtually rules out any uh, AI applications because you're, you really want like thousands and thousands of, uh, of patients, ideally if you can, and it would not be feasible to get written consent from everyone. Um, the other way that you can get it is if you have clinical trials that, that require ongoing monitoring. So if you're doing an interventional trial and you're giving somebody a drug and you need to be checking their blood work for the trial, then you can have access to Necare for it. Um, but as you can imagine, um, that, uh, that essentially rules out most applications if you're trying to do AI work. Uh, briefly mentioning other sources of data because they are relevant to the specialties of internal medicine, um, surgery, pharmacy, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, I will mostly leave these to others. Um, you can get information directly from patients via apps, medical devices, or a patient can enter information themselves. Uh, I do want to briefly mention uh, that the Pharmaceutical Information Network or PIN information uh, in Alberta this is what NetCare draws from and is every prescription, just about every prescription that's filled within Alberta. Uh, and it generates an automatic uh, uh, medication list, supposed to be an active medication list for every patient. In practice, it's reasonably accurate um, and it is very helpful. Uh, the other one I wanna talk about, public data repositories. I've been, been mentioning some of these. Um, and there are lots of excellent uh, public data repositories, more and more uh, coming all the time. Um, and you can really get around a lot of issues with data um, by just using those. So how to access the data yourself. Uh, so again, I mentioned um, my, uh, my bias is uh, from academia. And so I know it's possible to get health information from like a commercial industrial standpoint, but I don't know the specifics of how to do it. So I will tell you about what I know from the world of getting data um, for, uh, for research purposes. Uh, the prerequisites will be a principal investigator with a university appointment. As far as I know, you would be able to make it at least partway through the system um, by not having like a, someone with a, a professor title um, but eventually, um, you're probably going to have trouble if you are uh, if you're a student and you're not attached to somebody else in order to get things like REB, Research Ethics Board approval, um, or a data disclosure agreement with Alberta Health Services. And ideally, you have, well, you need both of those to get health information almost all of the time, um, all of the time if it has patient identifiers on it. If you are doing um, work with, uh, with both, for example, with like the U of A and the U of C, um, then you should have REB approval with both universities. To actually acquire the data, um, I've come up with three different ways of doing it. I don't think there are other ways. At least let me know if you have other ways that you've accessed um, like patient data. Um, but the ways that I've found are via something called Dimer, uh, data analytics, measurement, and reporting uh, or request. Uh, Dimer is, uh, is a part of Alberta Health Services. It's an office where they, um, they fill requests made for research and probably other purposes. Um, what a Dimer request ends up looking like is you give them criteria. You say, for example, I want to see, I want every patient that had appendicitis between 2017 and 2020, and then they will give you a list of, uh, of patient identifiers and whatever other data fields that seem relevant or that are helpful to you. Um, and this typically ends up taking the form of, of a CSE, a comma separated value um, file or an Excel file. It's clear that they're pulling these from their own databases but you don't get to make your own database requests, for example. Uh, another common way to get data is with research EMR access. Um, so the, how long, let's see, there's a question. How long does a dimer request typically take to acquire? 
Um, from the time that you that you submit the actual diamond request to the time that you get the data back is usually on the order of a couple weeks, like maybe in between two and four weeks, something like that. Um, it's reasonably fast. And if you need alterations to it and you, you say, oh, actually, I want like these people, they typically get back to you within a day or two. Um, so, so the actual dimer process is, is not super long. Uh, I will talk about the general timeline in a second. Um, the other way that, that I've accessed data that is with a research EMR access. So uh, for example, I've had uh, a research access um, account for SCM or Sunrise Clinical Manager, which is the EMR in Calgary. And you basically just use that in the same manner as a clinician would to look up patient information. And then you take it down manually into your spreadsheet or into REDCap or into some other uh, data management uh, software. Um, so again, difficult um, or at least time intensive um, to get enough data that would work well with AI applications. The last way, which is um, the best and the worst, obviously, um, is direct system or data access. Uh, for example, getting DICOM uh, data straight from PACS. So this can be challenging. It's challenging um, sometimes to get them to give you exactly what you want. Um, and often requires other requests. Like frequently, you can make like a dimer request to get a patient list, and then you and then you use that um, to make a request to uh, to PAX to to them for them to give you all of the CT scans that correspond with those appendicitis patients, for example. The biggest issue there um, is cost. Um, so, for example, uh, CT scans cost twenty dollars each. Um, and so those costs can rapidly, rapidly balloon if you're trying to use lots and lots and lots of data. Um, I was going to answer that question. How long? Oh, yeah. So uh, the timelines for this, it can take uh, several months to complete the entire process. Um, doing a um, creating a, a research ethics board uh, approval uh, proposal, um, submitting it. Um, fixing any issues with it, and then getting all of that back. You can usually do it, if you're motivated, you could do it in a month. You could probably get everything done in practice because you have to like get everything sorted out. You have to worry about your study protocol and everything. It usually takes a few months total. Oh, and then you have to do the dimer request after. It's usually a few months total before you can actually have the data in your hands. Uh, okay, and then how do I get involved? Um, well, the first thing that you should do, you should decide what your goals are. So if your goal is to contribute, um, uh, for example, a, a technical contribution to the field, you have an interesting idea for a theory of how you can, uh, you can apply some new concept in machine learning to, to healthcare data, um, then for example, you might be able to do everything using public data repositories. If you wanna make something that is clinically useful um, you know, ASAP, then you might need, or, or uses unusual or new data, then you might need to make your own data requests and kind of go through that whole ethics process and all of that. The next thing you should do, you should find the right people. Ideally, you would have both medical and technical domain experts involved right from the start um, in order to, to create your, your study design, to talk about, to find out what kind of data you're going to use and then to find out, um, uh, again, ground truth and uh, AI methodologies and techniques. It will be very helpful to have someone who is adept at academia as part of the team that you're working with. And so by that, I mean people who have experience in submitting ethics uh, approval applications, um, creating data sharing agreements, uh, and then also, ideally, who are familiar with publishing so that you're able to do that at the end. Next, find the right idea. There is sometimes, not always, a trade-off between clinical utility and technical feasibility. And that's part of the reason that it's important, ideally, to have both medical and technical domain experts involved. Um, finding, finding the right idea is also as much a part of finding uh, the right data. Um, the, 
they're intermingled together for sure. Um, sometimes you have a lot of data that you have happened to happened upon, somebody else has access to, um, or uh, for example, that you found a good repository online and then you wanna create an idea from that. And that's often a good way to do it, especially if the data is very high quality. Um, but the, the key thing for data is looking for the largest, most representative samples you can access ethically and economically. Once you have your data, you build, and then the final step, knowledge translation, ideally you publish something. Um, that's pretty much it. This is again, the academic side. I don't know as much about the commercial or industrial uh, way to do this, but I, I do know that people have, for example, data sharing uh, agreements like commercial entities do with, uh, with Alberta Health Services. Uh, there's a question about the data format. How would I know whether it is helpful or efficient? I think you're asking about like if you if you receive health information, you want to know um, whether the the format of the information is going to be something that is usable, um, and that will that will allow you to to build something. Um, yeah. Okay. So unfortunately, typically you get the data and you know immediately that it's going to take a lot of work. Um, like like when you get those comma separated values and everything just looks like it's a huge mess, um, it's often going to require a lot of work. Having a medical domain expert look at the data and tell you whether it's trustworthy, tell you which fields, um, which fields are important, which fields are not, which fields can mostly be trusted, which ones can't be trusted, um, that's a it's a difficult problem and it's it's really good to have people who are familiar with the clinical details of uh, going through the data with you um you know maybe not line by line but at least looking at all of the different data types and and helping you figure out um what you can use the best uh let's see any tips for becoming an insider my background is in software engineering and very little healthcare, so i feel like an outsider in understanding the problems that physicians face uh, for example how would you talk with the radiologist to get to understand their problems so you can build an ai app for example that actually helps them how do i talk to these healthcare workers okay i would say that Probably the best way to do it would be to find people who are already working on these types of things. Um, uh, like look at their university web pages, look at their publications. Um, and if people are working on these things, um, you could probably cold email them and and see if they would be see if they have any opportunities, um, anything that you could help them with. And you could talk about your skills and the various things that that you would bring to the table for this. Uh, can I also add that? So the AI and Medicine Student Society, are, that is our goal to address that problem because there is this big gap between healthcare professionals and uh, computing science and software engineers. So we're trying to build a community where those two groups can talk to each other. I love it. That sounds like an excellent solution. That's it. I'm done. Um, again, I am happy to stick around for questions uh, as long as you guys have them. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, I am gonna, so this is, uh, I have a collection of some of the public data um, just so that this makes it onto the presentation uh, on, uh, on YouTube. Um, Uh, Artificial Intelligence in Medicine Student Society, AIMS, A-I-M-S-S. -S. Uh, thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Shane. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can if I can uh, get those uh, the links uh, that were that were put into the uh, into the chat up on the presentation or, or otherwise available somewhere because um, there were some very helpful links to, for example, ASAP and Slicer. All right, thanks a lot, everybody. Okay, thank you, Scott. And before everybody leaves, I just want to take a minute to 
remind everyone of our AI and medicine, AI and healthcare symposium, March 12th to 13th. Uh, registration is still open if you haven't registered already.